Hello, hello everybody, how you doing? I hope you're well. Oh, I am looking a little bit over bright, sorry about that. Um, I had some changes that ended up being made to something in my, um, my um, camera setup and I can't even remember what it was the changes were. Uh, but obviously it's not looking quite like I used to have it. Uh, and yes, I have the cat's ears for a reason and we will get to that in a minute. Um, hmm. It's a little bit more realistic, I suppose. Oh well, that'll do. Right, here we go. Oh, sorry, I've got a knot in, in the muscle on the back of my shoulder at the moment. <sighs> right, I'll just move this slightly so you can see the ears. <laughs> They're all shiny. They've got glitter on them. And the reason I'm wearing cat's ears today is because we are having an animal-based story. We are having... The Story of Dr. Doolittle, which is the first book in the series of Dr. Doolittle books written by Hugh Lofting. And, oh, hang on a minute, I'm just, there's something weird on my, on the background there. Hmm, I don't know, whatever. Right, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pay any attention to that right at the moment. That's probably on my, um, my overlay, I've probably put a dash in the name between Hugh and Lofting, and it's come through on the um, graphics. I have no idea. It's just a technical thing. Why would I know that? Anyway, so here we go. We're going to have the first of the Dr. Doolittle books. Now, I remember reading Dr. Doolittle books when I was at school, at primary school. That's junior school or elementary school, I suppose it is, if you're in North America. Um, but they weren't the actual textbooks, text-based books, chapter books. I think they were a, an abridged version of them with a lot more illustrations. It feels kind of that way in my memory. Um, and yes, there was a TV series. I th I'm pretty sure there was a TV series. I don't remember any particular details of it. So I think I'm going to find that out for you because it seems very familiar. And I've been trying all afternoon to figure out why it's so familiar. And no, I have not seen the Eddie Murphy TV series. No, I have not seen the uh, Robert Downey Jr. movie. No, no, I have not seen the Robert Downey Jr. movie version either. So, Dr. Doolittle. Um, Hugh Lofting. So, first of all, we look up Hugh Lofting on um, Wikipedia. I can even give you a link for that if you wanted to look it up for yourself. No, that wasn't what I wanted. Sorry, I was pasting in what I'd previously been handling instead of... <laughs> Actually, sorry, I should have... I should have... Um, oh, I did too. Sorry. Yeah, I thought they were off, but they were on. There you go. Now you can respond. Sorry about that, Go Ricky. Thanks for mentioning it. Um... And I've had everybody telling me in chat, no, they haven't actually. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Sometimes my chat over on Discord will tell me, uh, but they didn't this time. So that was lovely. Very sweet of them. Uh, I have had somebody else talking to me in chat, but uh, that's about something completely different. So I'm going to completely ignore that one. Completely seems to be today's word of the day. So Hugh Lofting, I was finding out something about Dr. Doolittle. I was going to find out if there was... A reference to a TV series. Let's see. Because I'm pretty sure I remember seeing a kids TV series about it. Doesn't say. Mm, I probably have to look it up on IMDb. Which I'm not going to do at the moment. Right, so Dr. Doolittle was written in 19, or published in 1920. I shall just check this information. Yes, published in 1920. And from what I understand, it was first published in the States and then published in England, which seems a little bit odd, um, considering he was an English author. Not quite so unusual, but it happens that way. Um, hi, everybody. Good to have you all here. That's wonderful. 
Uh, go, or Creatures Great and Small, no. it was what That was a TV series I have actually watched. I did enjoy it. In fact, I re recognised one of the actors from it as an, as an older adult in another TV series because I grew up watching All Creatures Great and Small. The TV series was definitely... I'd like to say definitely acted, but maybe it wasn't. You know, kids' memories, all that sort of stuff. I'm going to find out for you. Just because otherwise I'm not going to be able to read properly. Doctor Doolittle. Yes, one day I shall get my um, microphone on a stand that is not on my desk. And so therefore it won't be quite so noisy. There was a TV series put out in 1970, The Adventures of Dr. Doolittle, the description. The Adventures of Dr. Doolittle, a veterinarian, Doc, John Doolittle, who can talk to the animals in his ongoing battle with pirate Sam Scurvy. That doesn't sound familiar. That really doesn't sound familiar. There was definitely something. Oh my god, I'll have to look it up afterwards and tell you guys all about it when I do finally find out what it was. And it was a TV series, I know that. But I thought it was done with actors for some reason. Oh well, that's just how it is. So, there. Now what I am going to do is pull up a picture of the author as a relatively young man I think I just have to find the right picture for it because yes I was trying to get things done before I started I got some of the other pictures sorted but I didn't get these ones sorted did I so here's the author as a young man it's coming it's coming the author as a young man there you go he looks rather earnest, doesn't he? Um, and apparently one of the reasons he wrote the stories, because he was he actually, the, the story started off as part of Letters Home to his children when he was in the First World War. And his reasoning behind writing these nonsense stories, the Dr. Doolittle stories, during the war in his Letters Home, were because... He considered that everything that was going on around him was either too horrible or too boring because there's a lot of hurry up and wait that goes on in the type of old-fashioned warfare that they had going on during the First World War uh, when you weren't being bombed or gassed or anything horrible like that in the trenches and being shot at and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, there was a lot of the just like mind-numbing trench digging and tr and um, tramping, marching somewhere and all sorts of stuff like this um, just because that's the way it goes and so instead of writing home about, to his family about the horrible things that were going on and the boring things that were going on he made up a, bits of a story and started sending them home in his letters for his children, for his family um, and they're actually set not in the time period that he was in, which is around the 1920s, well, First World War actually was when it was in his head. Um, they're actually set in the early Victorian period, which is, I was going to say 100 years before, no, it's more like 50 years before, I suppose, or 75 years before, I su something like that, one of those sort of things. Um, according to somebody else's website, there you go, you can make up some information yourself. Um, According to um, this particular website, um, it says, not Wikipedia, the main events in the story of Dr. Doolittle, which is this first book, took, take place in 1819 or 1820. So yes, a hundred years before this book was published. Um, a little bit like parts of our last book, the, the, story, the House of Arden, were the children time traveled a hundred years previously and then 200 years and then 300 or 250 years or something like that there were these big jumps that they did in there and they travel um, and it's a way of an author being able to say well yeah we've got the stuff going on in the current world at the moment we i don't really enjoy it i don't want to base my story on it i'm writing for children so therefore i'm going to place the story in a different time period um, so our Previous author, 
um, Edith Nesbitt actually did that by using time travel as part of that effect. Um, and it means that the children who are listening to the story in the first place, the real children listening to the written story, are going to actually be hopping out of their current world situation and putting themselves into a different situation and thinking about other things. Sometimes that's it's, it's good to have an escape from what's going on around us and sometimes it's also good to just think about how life is for other people in other times because we can get very idealised pictures of that in our heads and she does kind of address that. So in this story, I don't think it's going to be quite so dealing with current situations type stuff that the author was doing for his time period. Anyway, so I think that's enough of that sort of random information but I am going to bookmark the page because there might be some other books that these people talk about that I can look up through their, their website. I do like finding good sources that I can refer to again for additional information. So that is Hugh Lofting and we are going to have now the picture from the title page or the first illustration. The story of Dr. Doolittle and then it's got lots and lots of details of different characters and creatures told by Hugh Lofting and then blah 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 which I can't read because of the size of it on my screen being the history of his something rather life, regular life at home and astonishing adventures in foreign parts something something because it's a little hard to read when you've got glasses like me and it's tiny little words on the screen over there like that so this is what was in basically like the frontispiece of the book the the front page that you see that's about the book to make it appealing so you've got all these creatures this the characters this guy looks like a bit of a hard case this looks like we're going to be traveling to somewhere in Africa I think his cook maybe I don't know or somebody else I can't tell from this distance we've got a crocodile or an alligator a monkey a dog a pig a cockatoo or a parrot or something um, a duck not sure what that one is and then this two-headed beast here and if you know the story you will know what character that is so I'm not going to spoil it for you that's just the, the picture that we are going to have the picture of some of the characters that we're going to have in our story so there you go so I better say hello to everybody who's new here and everybody who watches this as a video a little bit later on over on YouTube um, hi I'm Jeff. I read old children's books. Yes, I am going to find my old children's book to wave at you. This is an example of the sort of books that I grew up reading. I didn't read this particular one because my dad only found it very recently in a box when he was sorting things out. But most of the books I read when I was growing up either were from the school library, were gifts that were given to me by grandparents, aunts and uncles, sometimes from parents, but we didn't have lots of money for books and books were expensive uh, and so when I ran out of books to read I would have a look through the boxes and the shelves at my grandparents place and often there would be books there that my parents had read and also my grandparents had read when they were children. Uh, so this particular one was given to my grandmother's brother, older brother, in July 1897 which means it's now over a hundred years old. This physical book is over 100 years, 125 years old and that's just sitting here in my house behind the magic screen, the magic wall, see <laughs> it's my green screen, it's a piece of green felt, it can be very simple the way you make things work for some technologies, it doesn't have to be all fancy and expensive. Anyway so that's the sort of books that I grew up reading, which were great because they made you think about other places and people from, from different cultures, uh, different classes of society, because it used to be more of a, um, a segregated thing than it is these days. Uh, people from different countries, people from different time periods, all of those things. Hi, Aranel. Hi, everybody else as well. And sorry, I should have actually done a bit of a shout out. So I'm just going to give you guys a shout out to some of my um, co-readers, my reader friends. So we've got here, we've got Goreki. 
Hi Jonathan, no, I haven't done my tips yet, so you haven't missed out. So there's go there's go Reiki, there is and yes I am typing them out because I haven't got them all set up. Um and you've also got not one of the go uh, the codex readers, but another person who reads. So you've also got Jonathan's Gamecast. So Arala and Goriki are both readers in Codex. And Codex is this bunch of awesome people who read on Twitch, read online, read old-fashioned books. They read public domain books. Public domain books are books that are no longer held within copyright because of how long ago they were published and how long ago the author died. Um, and so we are not violating anybody's copyright terms or anything like that by reading them, but it does give you the opportunity to read and um, listen. So read if you download them for yourself to read or look at them online, because you can through Project Gutenberg, which is where I get the digital copies that I read out to you. Um, so that's Project Gutenberg, which I've just put a link over in the chat for you. If you are watching on YouTube, you will have to come and have a look at my description page, my about page on Twitch. And you, you don't have to log in for it. You don't have to subscribe or anything like that. But if you come to my about page on Twitch, a lot of this information is, is linked there. Not the details, but, but some of the information such as the play, the different readers and stuff like that. So um, Goreki and Arunel are both readers on at Project as part of Project Gutenberg. Um, we also have a Discord server where those of us who are readers, but also are those of us who like listening to books that are public domain books and general friends and people who want to find out a little bit more about streaming security and things like that can all... Um, get together and chat there and as part of, uh, of of Codex on our Discord through via our Discord server we have things like a book club and a movie club which are on pause at the moment because it's summer holiday for the majority of our readers so I'm just going to give you hang on the Codex link there you go there's the Codex Discord server you can you're welcome to go over there and join it um, and Goreki's got lots of tips about how to keep your streaming space safe for you and also for your, your community. Uh, so please check that out. And he has some saved video videos on his Twitch page, which you can watch um, when, you, when it suits you to be able to find out more about it. And if you follow him, I'm sure you'll find out more about how to keep people safe on Twitch and doing things like stream, streaming and all that sort of stuff. There's all sorts of housekeeping things which are very wise to do. So I have some pretty strict rules in place for if you are new to my channel um, and you want to chat, there are some requirements. You will need to be following me. You will need to have a verified Twitch account rather than just having set it up this afternoon and not having confirmed anything um, and then deciding that you're going to drop a whole lot of spam in my chat. I've decided that that's not such a good thing. It's not very healthy for the people who do want to be here and relaxed and enjoying themselves. So I have some rules in place. And that also covers um, the sort of language that is used in chat. Um, so I want the place to be safe. I mean, I want everybody to be able to enjoy being here. It's not just for these people, um, but I want it specifically to be a safe place for grannies and their grandkids to be able to come and listen to old stories that the grannies have fond memories of um, as something that they can share together. Um, a shared activity from when granny was a kid that she can now share with her grandkids instead of just granny having to keep up with what the grandkids are doing all the time. So it's a way of combining those sort of things. So it's a safe place for them but it's a place where everyone else can be as well. It's just we just we do mind our language <laughs> and things like that here. So um, yes, you can join my Discord server. Um, yes, I do recommend that all of the Codex readers you follow them, and if if you really feel so inclined, subscribe to them too, which that will cost you. But Unless you are an Amazon Prime subscriber, in which case you get one free subscription that you can use every month on Twitch. Sorry, I think it's every month. Uh, 
Discord. I was going to give you my Discord link, wasn't I? There it is. Lots of um, <laughs> things being written in the chat that I'm putting up there. Sorry about that. Anyway, so there's all of that sort of stuff. And I think I've covered most of those things. No, I haven't done my tips yet. Hi Q, great to have you here. I hope you're feeling a little bit better. Um, I do know that I did hear about um, another friend, another streaming friend who's an artist actually, she's, she's lovely, hasn't been able to stream the last couple of days because she's not been well and so she spent yesterday lying snugly in bed, because it's winter here, snugly in bed, feeling terrible, getting a bit better um, and listening to our previous recordings from the book that we have just finished because she hadn't managed to catch them all previously so she's been doing catch up so that was a bit mind blowing for me someone who's just listened to six hours of my videos it's like oh. <laughs> and now feeling really serious anyway but she'd thoroughly enjoyed it and it was a great way to actually just give her mind space and not worry about day-to-day -day stuff which generally as adults when we're meant to be resting and recovering from something, we find it very, very hard to do. And sometimes we have to have something like watching a TV series, listening to a radio show, or engaging in something like this to just be a valid reason to stop and relax and rest. So yeah, my, my, my key takeaway for you is if you need rest, you take it. If you need to stop working at the moment because you're too ill or too tired, please do so. Look after yourself. Um, you're a lot nicer to be around when you're not in a bad mood because you're feeling unwell or tired as an extra hint. Um, so yeah, no, it's a great idea. Uh, I shall send her your regards, Q. I do hope that you're feeling better than you had been because I know that you hadn't been well for a, a, a while. Um, I'm just looking at the puzzles and wondering what we've got that would be suitable. I'm just going to have to randomly put up puzzles for you guys. If you think there are any keywords I can search for for jigsaw puzzles for doing today, then please let me know. That would be a great way to go, wouldn't it? Um, so just put them in the chat. Uh, yeah, you will have to be a follower to be able to chat. That's just one of the rules. Um, and I'm about to do my tips. I'm just making sure my phone is doing what it's meant to and that the sound is off, yay, and my headphones, the sound is off, yay, and my microphone is working. Slow and steady, I hope the exhaustion passes soon. Yes, do not push yourself too hard, okay? I have a number of friends who have chronic fatigue or um, fibromyalgia um, and family members. And the biggest takeaway they have for anyone who has had COVID or any other bug that has had them bedridden for a while and unable to work is give yourself time. Give yourself lots of rest because the sooner you start pushing yourself hard, the longer it's going to be before you get better. So yeah, take it slow and steady. Do a little bit, but don't do too much. Stop before you get exhausted. And if you're already exhausted, then go and have a rest even if it just means twiddling your thumbs and listening to a story. Right, tips, <sighs> tips. I have three tips for people who are new here. One, drinks, two, snacks, three, somewhere comfortable. So drinks, always have water handy because water is what keeps your brain and your body functioning as a very, very core thing that you need. Um, and I use this one to wave at you to remind you to have water just because it does, I love that bottle, I love the color of it, but it's not a good one to be drinking from because it knocks over very easily. It's quite skinny. Yes, that's my other, my more normal water bottle being opened. And that's because I forgot to top up my um, drinking cup, water cup, which I use because it's, yeah, does that make you want to go to the loo? Shall I splosh some more water around? Um can turn this into an ASMR channel, living ASMR, not um, staged ASMR. <laughs> not the drink, uh, the, the drinking in the water bottle, not the other inferences. <laughs> an animal puzzle for Dr. Doolittle, that sounds like a good idea. So what sort of animals? Um, elephant. 
just because I'm trying to think of elephants. Oh, there's a good one. Here's a picture of an elephant. I shall get that one going for you. Um, and then we can get going with our story. I am going to give you details on the other two tips as well, just because I know some of you want to know the extra details. <laughs> um, and we need to go to interact so I can actually set things up and then let you guys do the puzzle. So how many puzzle pieces do we need? Come on, get in quick. Thoughts on the number of pieces. So the standard it comes out with is 104, but people have been saying that, and it depends on how tired you are. I mean, some people want 150 plus. Okay, that's good. That's the sort of information I need. Uh, dark background, just because it fits in well with our styling here on this channel and get rid of the ad and the other bits and pieces put it into I'm nearly there I'm talking to myself as well as telling you what I'm doing so you don't feel like I've forgotten that you're there I know you're there jigsaw there it is now I can edit the link for you so that you can pull it up on the command don't do it yet don't do it yet Okay, you can do it. You can hit jigsaw and it will work. Or puzzle or PZ. So it's exclamation mark and then any of those uh, with no spaces, no capitals. But that should work for you. Um, I'm trying to think if there was anything else I specifically needed to cover before. No. Oh, and if you want to lurk, but let me know that you're here. In other words, just letting me know that you're okay with me saying hi to you or mentioning you um, then just hit uh, the command for that is exclamation mark lurk and that will just put a little bit of text up in the chat box um, others will know that you're there if you don't mind then that's cool um, anyone think I've got an obsession about snacks drinks and comfy seat I was just looking at what the lurk message says Oh, and I forgot to change my other message over here. Nobody told me. Why didn't you tell? <laughs> Sorry, guilting you out here. I'm just going to change the, the title on the stream, okay? The story, story is S-T-O-R-Y, not S-O-T. For some reason, I keep doing it wrong. I shall copy that and paste that into this one and then we shall be able to go a bit further that's done good I was going to get that done before we actually started streaming today and it just didn't happen did it oh dear I can reload that and that will sort it for me anyway and that's like that yeah, that one's showing it. I've got all these windows open on my computer. I did get stuck with only having one monitor for a little while, um, a while back. It was so frustrating because I'm so used to having one thing I'm doing here and the other thing I'm doing here. So I'm browsing, I'm looking at information, I'm checking out stuff on our website for our business. And then on, at the same time on my other monitor, I'm editing photos and I'm, I'm, I'm doing copying text for listings for things all sorts of stuff like that and it's just uh, so frustrating when you don't have all the tools available to you that you usually have um, I do have some pictures for the book as we get going so I'm just looking at this one because most of them I renamed them slightly um, I probably renamed them after I actually put the uh, links in place. That's what it is. Uh, that one's that one there. I re what I do is I actually name them so they're in a, a numerical sequence, but also that um, I can see the caption for the story, for that part of the story that it's in. 
because it makes it way easier to keep track of what you're actually um, showing people. <laughs> um, and I was in the middle of getting that already just before the stream started. So, and then I'll have to add some more shortly. So we've had we've had um, drinks. Um, I also have coffee because that's my favourite drink. Um, yeah, anyone who wants to just join in on the um, on the chat uh, on the jigsaw, just uh, if you've forgotten what the link is or you couldn't find it or you have arrived too late, just put an exclamation mark jigsaw or exclamation mark puzzle. I've got coffee. This form of coffee today. I'll give you the clear picture. Um, so it's a plunger pot. I get more ASMR for you. There you go. I've got coffee in my cup. It's not as strong as my usual coffee. I thought I'd give it a change for a while. But it also means I can have more than one cup in this particular time frame. I'd already drunk half of the previous cup and it was sitting there ready for me to add to. So, And it doesn't, because it's not so strong, um, it doesn't matter if it gets a bit cold. I still enjoy it. Uh, I used to work in an office where you you just kept a cup of coffee on the go, and it, it became a lot more pleasant to just have it with very little or no milk in it because it didn't go gluggy when it got cold. So there you go. Um, so drinks. I have water and coffee, and I hope you have handy your favourite drinks. Definitely water is one of your favourite drinks, and if it isn't yet, hopefully that can change eventually. Oh, that's weird. Sorry, I've just spotted something that's a little bit odd with a picture. Oh, that's what it is. <laughs> is it because the original picture is one size, it's gone and done weirdo things, so I'm going to have to delete that one and put another one in. Um, I reuse the, the handling system, but it's sized for one thing and then I'm using it for a different thing which is at a different scale and so it just sort of freaks out a little bit um, visually and then throws me because I'm not quite sure what I'm looking at. Right so drink uh, number one is drinks, number two is snacks and snacks today I have a snack jar, there you go see there's my treat treat jar with my QR code for my coffee tips but you won't be able to scan that because you're looking on your phone and that's what you'd need to scan it with and it's on your screen instead of in front of the camera. The treats today are my crackers because they're nice and plain. And I know last time I said they were boring, sad little things, but today they're not. They're just what I want. But I will have to take off my socks and slippers because I'm my feet and my party because it's getting too hot now. Um, it's one of the things that happens. I can be sitting here and be cold as, and then suddenly, no, it's not hot flushes. Don't be silly. This is just because I'm busy talking and when I'm sitting here earlier on I'm not busy talking because there's no one here to talk to. It's all your fault really. Yeah because usually when I'm sitting here if I'm not streaming I am doing edits of photos for our products and things like that. So drinks, snacks, I've got crackers, I hope you've got something yummy like chocolate or cheese and crackers and salami and sun-dried tomatoes and fruit paste and or hot crumpets hot buttered crumpets with golden syrup or banana splits or I don't know what other things are people's favorite foods banana cake carrot cake hummingbird cake I don't know any of those sort of things something yummy it, do, it doesn't actually really matter what it is as long as you're enjoying it Sometimes that can just be pot noodles uh, or cup noodle if you're in Japan or ramen, instant ramen. Um, one of those various cup noodle being a, a generic, um, a brand name, all that sort of stuff. Anyway, so snacks, drinks, snacks and somewhere comfortable. So I'm sitting on my favorite, my current favorite office chair because it doesn't have a big headrest behind me that looks a bit weird. A wall of black. Um, here's my squishy cushion with the, the cute pattern on it to remind me that I have to be somewhere comfortable so I can keep working for longer or reading for longer. Um, if you're not feeling well hopefully you've got somewhere where you can just spread out, lie down, pull the blankets up if you need to, shove the blankets off if you're too hot, lying in the bath if it's too hot and you want to sit in cool water, whatever. Um, 
but yeah, get yourself somewhere comfortable so you can relax. Uh, if you have to work, if I'm just keeping you company while you're doing the vacuuming or studying or counting courier bags or any of those other things that people do that are just jobs that you have to keep on working on but you need something to keep your brain occupied, then that's okay too. It does mean that you probably won't be quite as comfortable as if you're just listening to a story for the fun of it. Anyway, so with all that done and dusted, so to speak, um, how about we get on with reading? I need to unlock this again because it's gone to sleep. Uh, if you haven't come across it before, I tend to read my, my digital versions of books on a first-generation iPad mini. And the reason I'm reading on a first-generation iPad mini is because it's still alive. And it works just as well as any other way of doing a digital book for the sort of copies of books that I have access to. It works for that and it saves it from going into recycling or trash. So there you go. We'll get on with reading. Um, and I think I have a picture to start the story with. Yes, I do. Here we go. Illustrations. That is, yeah, I know you've only got the top of a roof there, but that is the first illustration apart from that, that frontispiece one. A little town called Puddleby on the Marsh. Puddleby, like as a puddle. Puddleby on the Marsh. There's a lot of places in England that have names that are just slightly odd like that, where they reference where they are as well as the name of the place. And sometimes it's also to do with... Um, There'll be several places that have the same name, and so they'll have a modifier for their name. So there'll be greater something and lesser something. There'll be magna something and minor something. Um, all that sort of stuff. There'll be upper and lower, whatever the village name is. They're usually village names, not town names. Um, the dedication for this book is to all children. Children in years and children in heart. I dedicate this story. I like that. Oh, here's a bonus tip for you. I forgot the bonus tip, didn't I? Make sure you've got a pencil or pen. Yes, I've got a little dinky one at the moment. Handy for writing down things that you want to look up later. So we found, we finally managed to figure out that a mangle wurzel is a type of vegetable. It's a root vegetable. A mangle wurzel, I'm going to put you all out of your misery since we've finished that book now. Um... Just writing down dedication because I want to remember to put a note about what that dedication is for somewhere else. Um, a mangle wurzel was used as a feed crop for animals and it was a field beet. So it is probably most closely related to a vegetable that in New Zealand gets called a swede, S W E D E. And I have no idea why we call it a Swede, because it is not Swedish. Um, another name for a Swede is a Rutabaga. Rutabaga. Uh, Rutabaga. R-U-T-A-B-A-G-A. -A -A. I think that's what it is. That, that's a weird word. That's why I'm quite happy to call it a Swede. Ah, here you go, rutabaga. Rutabaga. Uh, it's the North American name or Swede, which is British English and some Commonwealth English. It's a form of brassica, which is one of the root vegetable ones. So brassicas are the cabbage family. That means your Brussels sprouts, your... Um, oh, rutabaga is a Swedish word. Cool, that would help with understanding it, why it's a weird word. Um, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cabbage, mustard, uh, the mustard vegetable, the leaf vegetable, uh, turnips, swedes, obviously, um, kale, they are all the brassicas. No, that's not all of the brassicas. They are all brassicas. That's the family of plants that they are from. Um, and it is, uh, the rutabaga was actually, the swede was used as a, a seed that was planted out in the fields 
and then once it would sit in the ground for quite a long time it would it would probably cope fairly well with frosts um, there's a lot of, of animal feed that doesn't and so therefore it's got to be harvested earlier in the year and things like that it could sit in the ground for a certain amount of time then be pulled up dust it off you know get, get the worst of the dirt off and then put in a great big pile in the shed and and chopped up and fed out to the animals when they needed it it's a little bit hard on their teeth they do get their teeth do wear down a bit uh, but one of the things like a chaff cutter which is a thing that has a great big fly wheel and then jaws that push jaws that push something through and then the fly, fly wheel has a blade on it that as it goes around chops or chomps things um, a chaff cutter is this machine that you feed it's like straw and bits and pieces like that through it and it chops it into small pieces to make a finer feed for animals and so um, I have heard of places that use something similar to that but it doesn't squish down as much to feed it through for cutting up things like swedes and I'm pointing over at my monitor because there's a picture there and um, therefore it's something which gets chopped down into smaller pieces so that the animals can cope with them because a swede is like this big and I remember walking home from the school bus stop one time up by the, our local shop store because uh, we're out of town a little bit um, oh yeah it says there it's a, a Swedish word and the we took a shortcut through where there was, was going to eventually be a proper road that came from just below the shop down and around across the fields down the hill towards where there were a cluster of houses near the bottom of the bay where I lived and several of my friends we all got off at the same bus stops the others went the other way from the store and in the field we found Swedes growing just randomly growing in this paddock a paddock uh, an animal field uh, um, where you have grass that the animals feed on and obviously at some stage the farmer had put Swedes in and had just left them there because what happens is yes they can be used for animal feed but also because they're a, a root vegetable they tend to as they grow expand and if you've got clay soil and they if they are a plant that will grow there well they help with breaking up the upper level of the soil the clay a little bit to break it down so that it can actually grow grass better just by having the plant growing there so there you go um, and you don't really need to know a lot more about them uh, one of the weird things to do with um, Swedes was at one stage they were actually used as before turnips were used no not turnips before pumpkins were used for jack-o-lanterns at Halloween Swedes were used they were hollowed out so a mangle wurzel is the rougher end of that type of vegetable style um, it's probably a more wild variety of a swede um, but it's specifically grown for animal feed and I have no idea why we actually ended up with that one as being one I was asking you about but I think it was mentioned in our previous story the house of Arden so anyway that's enough random stuff let's get on with reading the story I'm sure we're going to come across some weird words and you guys can look them up and tell me what they are when we get going I do like finding out about words though and things no I'm not going to read the introduction to the tenth printing it looks too long it's all about the book and the author and that's not my sort of we're here to read the book or find out about weird things like strange vegetables uh, mangle wurzel was where the name for um, um, Wurzel Gummidge, does anyone remember Wurzel Gummidge on TV? That's another thing for you to look up. He was a scarecrow, but he was live. And his name was Wurzel Gummidge, so it's Wurzel from the second half of Mangle Wurzel. The story of Dr. Doolittle by Hugh Lofting. Here we go, story time. The first chapter, Puddleby and I think Mm, no I'm gonna get them set up over on the discord server um, the, ch the book actually has little illustrations for the first letter on each ca um, chapter uh, which means that when I'm trying to read it here because it doesn't actually have those ones in place this, uh, this copy I have 
Um, I'm missing out on that first letter. I have to guess what the word is. It's not that hard. But they're, they're just very simple little illustrations that incorporate the shape of a letter. So the first chapter, Puddleby. Once upon a time, many years ago, when our grandfathers were little children, great, great grandfathers now probably, there was a doctor and his name was Doolittle. John Doolittle, MD. MD means that he was a proper doctor and he knew a lot, a whole lot. He lived in a little town called Puddleby on the Marsh. All the folks, young and old, knew him well by sight, and whenever he walked down the street in his high hat, that's like a top hat, you know, they're describing it rather than using the, the generic name for it. Um, whenever he walked down the street in his high hat, everyone would say, there goes the doctor, he's a clever man, and the dogs and the children would all run up and follow him, and even the crows who lived in the church tower would caw and nod their heads. The house he lived in on the edge of the town was quite small, but his garden was very large and had a wide lawn and stone seats and weeping willows hanging over. His sister, Sarah Doolittle, was housekeeper for him, but the doctor looked after the garden himself. He was very fond of animals and kept many kinds of pets. Besides the goldfish in the pond at the bottom of his garden, he had rabbits in the pantry, white mice in his piano, a squirrel in the linen closet, and a hedgehog in the cellar. He had a cow with a calf too, that's a baby cow, and an old lame horse, 25 years of age, and chickens, and pigeons, and two lambs, and many other animals, but his favourite pets were Dab Dab the duck, Jip the dog, Gub Gub the baby pig, Polynesia the parrot, and the owl, Tutu. His sister used to grumble about all these animals and said they made the house untidy. They probably also miss places that they're not meant to. Mm. One day when an old lady with rheumatism, oh, and one day when an old lady with rheumatism came to see the doctor, she sat on the hedgehog who was sleeping on the sofa and never came to see him anymore, but drove every Saturday all the way to Oxenthorpe another town 10 miles off to see a different doctor. And I've got a picture for that one. I just have to find it. Sorry. I'm looking over my book stand. Oh, that's the one that I can't find. I'll have to try again. Oh, no, I can. It is there. It's just not where I thought it was. It had moved. No, come back. I have no idea why it's doing this these days. I used to be able to resize them without them jumping. I think it depends on which handle I use. So, there's Dr. Doolittle with his tall hat. There's the hedgehog. There's a footstool. This is the sofa. And this is the old lady who is departing in a hurry because she doesn't really want to sit on hedgehogs every time she goes to see her doctor. I don't really blame her. It would be a little bit awkward. There's the one that's gone missing, and I don't know where it is. I will have to delete that and create a new one for the next illustration. Right, carrying on with the story. And then his sister, Sarah Doolittle, came to him and said, this is after the patient decided she wasn't coming back, John, how can you expect sick people to come and see you when you keep all these animals in the house? It's a fine doctor would have his parlour full of hedgehogs and mice. That's the fourth personage these animals have driven away. Squire Jenkins and the parson say they wouldn't come near your house again, no matter how sick they are. You, we are getting poorer every day. If you go on like this, none of the best people will have you for a doctor. You are, But I like animals better than the best people, said the doctor. You are ridiculous, said his sister, and walked out of the room. So as time went on, the doctor got more and more animals, and the people who came to see him got less and less, till at last he had no one left except the cat's meat man, who didn't mind any kind of animals, but the cat's meat man wasn't very rich, and he only got sick once a year, at Christmas time, when he used to give the doctor sixpence for a bottle of medicine. 
sixpence a year wasn't enough to live on, even in those days long ago, and if the doctor hadn't had some money saved up in his money box, no one knows what would have happened. And he kept on getting still more pets, and of course it cost a lot to feed them, and the money he had saved up grew littler and littler. Then he sold his piano and let the mice live in a bureau drawer, but the money he got for that too began to go, so he sold the brown suit he wore on Sundays and went on becoming poorer and poorer. And now when he walked down the street in his high hat, people would say to one another, There goes John Doolittle, M.D. There was a time when he was the best-known doctor in the West Country. Look at him now. He hasn't any money, and his stockings are full of holes. But the dogs and the cats and the children still ran up and followed him through the town, the same as they had done when he was rich. And then we're going to come into the next chapter, and I need to find a way to get you the next picture. So I'm just going to take a moment and add in another picture source, just because I like to have a stack of them here. So it's easy to um, go from one to the next. this down here and it's not going to show itself too soon is it? Ah. I know there's a picture coming up very soon so that's why I'm looking for this. Right. Oh yeah, and because it's a new one I have to put it in where it's meant to be. Oh, come back. Oh, yay, puzzles done. Wonderful, wonderful. There you go, some elephants. That's cool. Um African elephants at Kruger National Park, South Africa. My cousin's just been there. That was fun. Um Animals, animals. Let's think of another animal we can do. Oh, I did see another elephant one. I know it's not specifically about elephants, this one, but this, in, this intrigued me, this one. I shall get this ready for you, and then I'll carry on reading. I'm putting that one slightly more, 168 puzzle pieces, because otherwise it's 140 something. And I shall get this over here for you, and then you can carry on with the next one. Hold your horses. And go. We are go on the puzzle. Oh, I didn't actually get that tidy for you, did I? I'll just do that now. There, that's better. Right. <laughs> this one might be a little bit more challenging just because of the way the picture's done. Anyway, we'll see how we go. See how we go. Right, the second chapter, Animal Language. I'm sorry, I'm just looking at this because it's got a bit missing at the, at the beginning of the word and it seems like a very strange way of the beginning of the word starting if it's only got one letter missing. I'm just going to find it in here. There you go. Okay, that makes sense now. It happened one day that the doctor was sitting in his kitchen talking with the cat's meat man. Now the cat's meat man is obviously the chap who works for the place that provides cat's meat because they didn't have it in dried kibbles and things like that in the old days. Um, he was sitting in the kitchen talking with the cat's meat man who had come to see him with a stomach ache. This, I don't think this is his Christmas visit. 
Sorry, I just had a quick mouthful. Why don't you give up being a people's doctor and be an animal doctor? Asked the cat's meat man. That's a good question. Especially since he seems to get on so well with animals. <clears throat> the parrot, Polynesia, was sitting in the window looking out at the rain and singing a sailor song to herself. She stopped singing and started to listen. You see, Doctor, the cat's meat man went on, you know all about animals, much more than what these here vets do. That book you wrote about cats, why it's wonderful. I can't read or write myself, but maybe I'd write some books. But my wife, Theodosia, she's a scholar she is, and she read your book to me. Well, it's wonderful, that's all I can say, wonderful. You might have been a cat yourself. You know the way they think. And listen, you can make a lot of money doctoring animals. Do you know that? You see, I'd send all the old women who had sick cats or dogs to you. And if they didn't get sick fast enough, I could put something in the meat I sell them to make them sick. See? Oh, no, said the doctor quickly. You mustn't do that. That wouldn't be right. Oh, I don't mean real sick, answered the cat's meat man. Just a little something to make him droopy like what I was referenced to, what I was what I had reference to. But as you say, maybe it ain't quite fair on the animals. But they'll get sick anyway because the old women always give them too much to eat. It sounds like the author is a fairly keen observer of humanity because I've observed this, the, the very same thing myself. And look, all the farmers around about who had lame horses and weak lambs, they'd come. Be an animal, doctor. When the cat's meat man had gone, the, par the parrot flew off the window onto the doctor's table and said, The man's got sense. That's what you ought to do. Be an animal, doctor. Give the silly people up. If they haven't brains enough to see you're the best doctor in the world, take care of animals instead. They'll soon find it out. Be an animal, doctor. Oh, there are plenty of animal doctors, said John Doolittle, putting the flower pots outside on the window sill to get the rain. Yes, there are plenty, said Polynesia, but none of them are any good at all. Do listen, Doctor, and I'll tell you something. Did you know that animals can talk? This is a very fluent parrot. I knew that parrots can talk, said the Doctor. Oh, we parrots can talk in two languages, people's language and birds' language, said Polynesia proudly. If I say Polly wants a cracker, you understand me, but hear this. Kaka oi fifi? Good gracious, said the doctor. What does that mean? That means, is the porridge hot yet? In bird language. My, you don't say so, said the doctor. You never talked that way to me before. What would have been the good? said Polynesia, dusting some cracker, cracker crumbs off her left wing. You wouldn't have understood me if I'd had. Tell me some more, said the doctor, all excited, and he rushed over to the dressing drawer. Dress, dresser drawer, dressing table I was going to say, dresser, cabinet, with drawers and cupboards, also sometimes referred to as a sideboard, we've had one of them before in the other book, and came back with the butcher's book and a pencil, now don't go too fast and I'll write it down, this is interesting, very interesting, something quite new, give me the birds ABC first, slowly now, so that was the way the doctor came to know that that animals had a language of their own and could talk to one another. And all that afternoon, while it was raining, Polynesia sat on the kitchen table, giving him bird words to put down in the book. At tea time, when the dog Jip came in, the parrot said to the doctor, See, he's talking to you. Looks to me as though he was scratching his ear, said the dog, the doctor. But animals don't always speak with their mouths, said the parrot in a high voice raising her eyebrows. They talk with their ears, with their feet, with their tails, with everything. Sometimes they don't want to make a noise. Do you see now the way he's twitching up one side of his nose? What's that mean? said the doctor. That means, can't you see that it has stopped raining? Polynesia answered. He is asking you a question. Dogs nearly always use their noses for asking questions. After a while, with the parrot's help, the doctor got to learn the language of animals so well that he could talk to them himself, 
and understand everything they said. Then he gave up being a people's doctor altogether. <laughs> as soon as the cat's meat man had told everyone that John Doolittle was going to become an animal doctor, old ladies began to bring him their pet pugs and poodles who had eaten too much cake, and farmers came many miles to show him sick cows and sheep. One day a plough horse was brought to him, and the poor thing was terribly glad to find a man who could talk in horse language. You know, doctor, said the horse, that vet over the hill knows nothing at all. He has been treating me for six weeks now for spavins. Spavins, I think, actually is a real thing. Shall we find out, or do you want to do that for me? Mm, spavins, S-P-A-V-I-N-S. I shall write the word in the chat for you so you can look it up. I should probably have some sort of plug-in that if I type a word into chat with a command, it will look it up for us and give us the definition, as long as it wasn't too long. What I need is spectacles. I'm going blind in one eye. There's no reason why horses shouldn't wear glasses the same as people. But that stupid man over the hill never even looks at my eyes. He keeps on giving me big pills. I tried to tell him, but he couldn't understand a word of horse language. What I need is spectacles. Of course, of course, said the doctor. I'll get you some at once. I would like a pair like yours, said the horse. Only green. They'll keep the sun out of my eyes while I'm ploughing the fifty-acre field. Certainly, said the doctor, green ones you shall have, so tinted like sunglasses. You know the trouble, sir, said the plough horse, as the doctor opened the front door to let him out. Sorry, itchy eye now. Talking of eyes. No, it's not from the cat, although he is on the sofa behind me. You know the trouble, sir. The plough horse said as the doctor opened the front door to let him out. The trouble was that anybody thinks he can doctor animals just because the animals don't complain. As a matter of fact, it takes a much cleverer man to be a really good animal doctor than it does to be a good people's doctor. Yeah, because most of them can't understand what the problem is, that's why. My farmer's boy thinks he knows all about horses. I wish you could see him. His face is so fat he looks as though he has no eyes and he's got as much brain as a potato bug. He tried to put a mustard plaster on me last week. Where did he put it? said the doctor. Oh, he didn't put it anywhere on me, said the horse. Very patient. Oh, no, 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 sorry. I skipped a paragraph said the horse. He only tried to. I kicked him into the duck pond. Well, well, said the doctor. I'm a pretty quiet creature as a rule, said the horse. Very patient with people. Don't make much fuss. But it was bad enough to have that vet giving me the wrong medicine. And when that red-faced Booby started to monkey with me. I just couldn't bear it any more. Did you hurt the boy much? asked the doctor. Oh, no, said the horse. I've kicked him in the right place. The vet's looking after him now. When will my glasses be ready? I'll have them for you next week, said the doctor. Come in again Tuesday. Good morning. Then John Doolittle got a fine big pair of green spectacles, and the plough horse stopped going blind in one eye and could see as well as ever. And here we have our picture. No, not that picture. Sorry. There. There's the horse with his spectacles, and there's Dr. Doolittle pointing at an eye chart. <laughs> there you go. Amusing, not what you'd expect. And the plough horse stopped going blind in one eye and could see as well as ever. <laughs> that is a very big horse. 
I'm thinking it's kind of like forced perspective. See how big my hand is compared with this hand. <laughs> Even though they're the same size. I think that's the, the guy who did the pictures for it, which may be the author, just sort of playing around with it. Although plough horses are generally a lot bigger than, than average horses. <laughs> oh, there you go. Spavin, I was right. Spavin, Spavins, a disorder of a horse's hock. Like osteoarthritis in people, the cause of spavins is not very well understood. Okay, there you go. Uh, degenerative non-septic non arthritis of the smaller hock joints. Now, the hock is like the ankle on a horse. It's more often seen in older horses and ponies and is a common cause of hind limb lameness. So obviously that's, it's more common in the back feet. The lameness can range from mid -stiff, mild stiffness with toe dragging to quite severe. It may, may affect one or both hind limbs. I would guess that the vet just thought, ah oh, yeah, it's an old horse, therefore it's going to have spavins, so I'm going to give it a treatment for that. Simple, in his mind. You know, cheating, cheats. Um, Lazy, lazy veterinary practice. Lazy. People do that with doctors too. Some doctors do that. Sorry, I'm getting my crackers out. Not really calming ASMR, is it? <laughs> Sorry about that. Crackers. I've got burps now. Indigestion. So a plain cracker should help. And the plow horse stopped going blind in one eye and could see as well as ever. It probably had developed into a form of muscular laziness and so by having it so that it was actually corrected the eye actually put the effort in i don't know i'm not going to go with trying to be a vet here as so and soon it became a common sight to see farm animals wearing glasses in the country round puddleby and a blind horse was a thing unknown and so it was with all the other animals that were brought to him as soon as they found that he could talk their language they told him where the pain was and how they felt. And of course it was easy for him to cure them because he knew what was going on. Um, and here we have another illustration. I just have to find it. Yes, here it is. No, this one. Because they're all from different sized sources. And the caption on that is, They came at once to his house on the edge of town. Although I'm not too sure how the horses would have liked it with going up and down the steps. The steps to going down would be worse than going up. But that's the style of, of house from that era. Very much a 1920s, 1910s, 1920s house. In fact, where I used to live in southern England, in southern Surrey, um, this style was not uncommon in the slightly older houses out in the countryside and on the edges of um, town where it hadn't been done up. Now all these animals went back and told their brothers and friends that there was a doctor in the little house with the big garden who really was a doctor. There you go, that's how it works. <laughs> and that makes a lot more sense. Oop. Come back there. Sorry, I'm resizing another picture, getting it ready. That there was a doctor in the little house with the big garden who really was a doctor. And whenever any creatures got sick, not only horses and cows and dogs, but all the little things of the field like harvest mice and water voles, badgers and bats, they came at once to his house on the edge of the town, so that his big garden was nearly always crowded with animals trying to get in to see him. There were so many that came that he had to have special doors made for the different kinds. He wrote horses over the front door, cows over the side door, and sheep on the kitchen door. 
Every kind of animal had a separate door. Even the mice had a tiny tunnel made for them into the cellar where they waited patiently in rows for the doctor to come round and see them. And so in a few years' time, every living thing for miles and miles got to know about John Doolittle, M.D. And the birds who flew to other countries in the winter told the animals in foreign lands of the wonderful doctor of Puddleby on the Marsh, who could understand their talk and help them in their troubles. Hmm. In this way, he became famous among the animals all over the world, better known even than he had been among the folks of the West Country. He was a people doctor. And he was happy and liked his life very much. So I'm just going to scroll through the other version of the book that I have up here to see if there's anything else I've got to get ready. Right, okay, sorted. One afternoon, when the doctor was busy writing in a book, Polynesia sat in the window, as she nearly always did, looking out at the leaves blowing about in the garden. Presently, she laughed aloud. What is it, Polynesia? asked the doctor, looking up from his book. I was just thinking, said the parrot, and she went on looking at the leaves. What were you thinking? said the doctor. I was thinking about people, said Polynesia. People make me sick. They think they're so wonderful. The world has been going on now for thousands of years, hasn't it? And the only thing in animal language that people have learned to understand is that when a dog wags his tail, he means I'm glad. It's funny, isn't it? You are the very first man to talk like us. Oh, sometimes people annoy me dreadfully. Such airs they put on talking about the dumb animals. Dumb? Ha! Huh. Why, I knew a macaw once who could say good afternoon in seven different ways, seven different ways, without once opening his mouth. He could talk every language and Greek. An old professor with a grey beard taught him, but he didn't stay. He said the old man didn't talk Greek right, and he couldn't stand listening to him teach the language wrong. I wonder what's become of him. That bird knew more geography than people will ever know. People? Golly! I suppose if people ever learn to fly like any common hedge sparrow, we shall never hear the end of it. You're a wise old bird, said the doctor. How old are you really? I know that parrots and elephants sometimes live to be very, very old. I can never quite be sure about my age, said Polynesia. It's either 183 or 182, but I know that when I first came here from Africa, King Charles was still hiding in the oak tree. Because I saw him, he looked scared to death. And that's the end of chapter two. There you go. The third chapter, which is what it's called, the third chapter. More money troubles. Oh dear. And soon now the doctor began to make money again. And his sister Sarah bought a new dress and was happy. Some of the animals who came to see him were so sick they had to stay at the doctor's house for a week. And when they were getting better, they used to sit in chairs on the lawn. There you go. They used to sit in chairs. There's the doctor talking to them. There's the afternoon tea. There's a bird of some sort. Is it? I think. No? No, it's a... It's got a long nose. Fox, maybe, with a rug over it. And then there's a dog lying in the other deck chair on the lawn. <laughs> oh dear. Right, next one. And often, even after they got well, they did not want to go away. They liked the doctor and his house so much. And he never had the heart to refuse them when they asked if they could stay with him. So in this way, he went on getting more and more pets. Once when he was sitting on his garden wall, smoking a pipe in the evening, an Italian organ grinder came around with a monkey on a string. That's, we, that's, do you remember when it showed us the picture of him with his house at the edge of town? No, not that one. This one. There's someone sitting on the wall. That might be the inspiration from, that might have been that part of the illustration of where the house is, having someone sitting on the wall, maybe because of the bit we're now reading. We'll carry on. Is 
sorry, I am going to get the next one ready. Just because they sneak up pretty quick in this story. Right. Once when he was sitting on his garden wall, smoking a pipe in the evening, an Italian organ grinder came round with a monkey on a string. The doctor saw at once that the monkey's collar was too tight and that he was dirty and unhappy. Oh, yay, were the puzzles finished? An African elephant taking a swim. And the photograph has been taken by William Bradbury. There you go. My goodness, that is not what you expect to see. That's why I wanted to put it up for you. I will find the next picture, though. What are we going to have? What animal are we going to have for a, one, for a puzzle now? Because that was me searching for elephant. Thoughts? I'm not going to put in Swede or Mangle Wurzel or Rutabaker, Rutabaker, whatever, Swede. Ele animals. Polynesia was a parrot. Let's see if we've got parrots. I want a parrot that is not in a cage. How about this one? That looks like it's going to be good. And let's find the jigsaw section. And I shall do this for you. 154 puzzle pieces. And there's your background. I shall get you the link. A link in here so you can use it in chat and that's been saved for you and you can hit the um, jigsaw command now whenever you're ready so there you go oh sorry fox I wasn't quite quick enough do you want me to change it back to fox I've got a parrot at the moment I'll write fox down so that the next time if either today or next time we'll do fox there you go. <laughs> right, so the doctor saw at once that the monkey's collar was too tight and that he was dirty and unhappy. I suppose I could do monkey after the fox. Although the style of the monkey is probably not going to be quite the same as what we've got in the book. Um, the doctor saw at once that the monkey's collar was too tight and that he was dirty and unhappy, so he took the monkey away from the Italian gave the man a shilling and told him to go. The organ grinder got awfully angry and said that he wanted to keep the monkey, but the doctor told him that if he didn't go away, he would punch him on the nose. John Doolittle was a strong man, though he wasn't very tall, so the Italian went away saying rude things, and the monkey stayed with the doctor and had a good home. The other animals in the house called him Chi Chi, which is a common word in monkey language, meaning ginger. I'm guessing it means the colour ginger, like orangey ginger. And another time when the circus came to Puddleby, the crocodile, who had a bad toothache, escaped at night and came into the doctor's garden. The doctor talked to him in crocodile language and took him into the house and made his tooth better. But when the crocodile saw what a nice house it was with all the different places for all the different kinds of animals, he too wanted to live with the doctor. He asked, couldn't he sleep in the fish pond at the bottom of the garden if he promised not to eat the fish? When the circus men came to take him back, he got so wild and savage that he frightened them away. <sighs> But to everyone in the house, he was always as gentle as a kitten. But now the old ladies grew afraid to send their lap dogs to Dr. Doolittle because of the crocodile. And the farmers wouldn't believe that he would not eat the lambs and sick calves they brought to be cured. So the doctor went to the crocodile and told him he must go back to his circus. But he wept such big tears and begged so hard to be allowed to stay that the doctor hadn't the heart to turn him out. So then the doctor's sister came to him and said, 
John, you must send that creature away. Now the farmers and the old ladies are afraid to send their animals to you just as we were beginning to be well off again. Now we shall be ruined entirely. This is the last straw. I will no longer be housekeeper for you if you don't send away that alligator. It isn't an alligator, said the doctor. It's a crocodile. I don't care what you call it, said his sister. It's a nasty thing to find under the bed. I won't have it in the house. But he has promised me, the doctor answered, that he will not bite anyone. He doesn't like the circus, and I haven't the money to send him back to Africa, where he comes from. He minds his own business, and on the whole is very well behaved. Don't be so fussy. I tell you, I will not have him around, said Sarah. He eats the... He, papa, I know the words, but... He eats the linoleum. If you don't send him away this minute, I'll I'll go and get married. <laughs> what a threat. <laughs> All right, said the doctor, go and get married. It can't be helped. And he took his hat and went out into the garden. So Sarah Doolittle packed up her things and went off, and the doctor was left all alone with his animal family. Oh dear, oh dear. And we have a picture. Um, I think this is the right picture. Yes, there you go. That looks like her and a grump. There's the crocodile. And there's the doctor. He's picking up his hat to go out into the garden. <laughs> Everyone's in a grump. Sorry, it's just because of, of one of the words that is represented in those letters as to why that word was banned, uh, wasn't allowed through the acronym. So, anyway, I'll carry on. <laughs> Except that he's a crocodile, not an alligator. <laughs> His sister would have been so upset with him. Oh, dear. Dear, putting the next right picture. I'm getting it into the right place. Okay, carrying on. <laughs> Took down his hat and went out into the garden. So Sarah Doolittle packed up her things with, and went off, and the doctor was left all alone with his animal family. And very soon he was poorer than he had ever been before. With all these mouths to fill and the house to look after and no one to do the mending and no money coming in to pay the butcher's bill, things began to look very difficult. But the doctor didn't worry at all. That would have been so frustrating for his sister. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he was, he was standing up sort of like this. <laughs> Money is a nuisance, he used to say. We'd all be much better off if it had never been invented. What does money matter so long as we are happy? Well, who's going to pay the bills? But soon all the animals themselves began to get worried. And one evening when the doctor was asleep in his chair, there he is. I'll just move it up slightly. There you go. He's asleep in his chair. Here's some of the animals, and there's other animals, and there's other animals all over the place. Um, but I'll just put it there so you can see where the doctor is. So one evening when the doctor was asleep in his chair before the kitchen fire, they began talking it over among themselves in whispers, and the owl, Tutu, who was good at arithmetic, figured it out that there was only money enough left to last another week. If they each had one meal a day and no more. Ooh, it's making my tummy feel like grumbling, being hungry. Then the parrot said, I think we all ought to do the housework ourselves. At least we can do that much. After all, it is for our sakes that the old man finds himself so lonely and so poor. That's a good point, yes. Well, it's about time they sort of contributed somehow.
So it was agreed that the monkey, Chi Chi, was to do the cooking and mending, the dog was to sweep the floors, the duck was to dust and make the beds, the owl, Tutu, was to keep the accounts, and the pig was to do the gardening. They made Polynesia, the parrot, housekeeper and laundress, because she was the oldest. Of course, at first they all found their new jobs very hard to do, all except Chi Chi, who had hands, and could do things like a man, human, but they soon got used to it, and they used to think it great fun to watch Jip the dog sweeping his tail over the floor with a rag tied onto it for a broom. After a little, they got to do the work so well that the doctor said he had never had his house kept so tidy or so clean before. I don't think much of the standard of what he thought his sister's housekeeping was like, but fantasy story, there you go. In this way, things went along all right for a while, but without money, they found it very hard. Then the animals made a vegetable and flower stall outside the garden gate and sold radishes and roses to the people that passed along by the road. But still, they didn't seem to make enough money to pay all the bills. And still, the doctor wouldn't worry. When the parrot came to him and told him that the fishmonger wouldn't give them any more fish, he said, never mind, as long as the hens lay eggs and the cow gives milk, we have, can have omelettes and junket. Do you know what junket is? Go on, look it up, junket. No, not meaning a jaunt or a journey. That's a slang use of the word. I've given you the word in the chat. You can look that one up too. What was the other one that you were going to look up? Uh, no, I looked it up for you. That's right. It was spavins. This one is junket. You can look that one up. <sighs> and the, um, we can have omelettes and junket. And there are plenty of vegetables left in the garden. The winter is still a long way off. Don't fuss. That was the trouble with Sarah. She would fuss. I wonder how Sarah's getting on, an excellent woman, in some ways. Well, 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 but the snow came earlier than usual that year, and although the old lame horse hauled in plenty of wood from the forest outside the town so that they could have a big fire in the kitchen, most of the vegetables in the garden were gone, and the rest were covered with snow, and many of the animals were really hungry. Oh. Oh no, that's the end of the third chapter. So Q has looked it up for us. Junket, dish of sweetened and flavoured curds of milk, often served with fruit. And I've had junket. It used to be a dessert that my mum would make. Um, fairly regularly, not all the time. It's kind of, it sets a little bit like jelly, but it doesn't hold together the way that jelly does. Um, and so when you put your spoon into it, it breaks away and, and you get this. It's, it's very yummy. It's sweetened. It has vanilla in it. Um, and yes, it's often served. It's, it's very old fashioned. <laughs> it's not something that you have these days. It needs rennet to make it set. And rennet is a, a liquid that's in a little bottle or a jar that you can get from the, the grocers. You used to be able to get from the grocers. And it was something that was produced in the um, in the meat processing um, systems, kind of associated with that because it's to do with stomach acid um, or something like that. I'm not quite sure what. Don't need those sort of details. But it was not wasn't not an uncommon dessert. Very simple. Although you had to make sure that once you'd heated it and it started to cool down. You didn't disturb it, because as soon as you disturb it, it breaks the curd and it doesn't set properly. It just goes all like cottage cheese, but not hard sort of thing. Um, so you had to, you put, you mixed it all up and you heated it. You heated the milk, you heated the, and dissolved the sugar in it and things like this. And then you poured it into what you were serving it from. So my mum, even with us children being at an age where glasses and dishes and stuff got broken very easily. She had some lovely, very, very thin glass, um, like goblets, but the, the bowl of them was about this big, uh, glasses on a stem, um, and they had this lovely golden sheen to them, a luster to them. And so she'd make it, and then while it was still warm enough to not set, pour it in to each of these gob 
goblets, each of these glasses, and then and then take the whole thing on a tray and put it in a corner of the bench where it's set without being moved at all, otherwise it wouldn't work. And leave it in the corner, and we would have it for dessert that night. It was yummy, very, very yummy. Um, it was also often used as a, a pleasant sweet food for invalids, people who were unwell, whose digestion didn't work very well, um, because it was a way of giving, making sure that they had enough easy to digest protein from the milk proteins because of the rennet in it, it became easier even to digest than normal milk is. And also yogurt wasn't really a done thing back then. So that's what that was. And that was the end of the third chapter and they were going to have chunk it to eat. Oh dear. The fourth chapter starts as it's titled A Message from Africa. So... It's only 10 pages. I'm thinking I can read that one. Yeah, we shall get on with it. And then I think that'll be it for today. But it gives you enough time to do that puzzle too. So, the fourth chapter. A message from Africa. Hmm... I just do need to, before I start reading, I do need to queue up the next picture. So that when we get to it in the text, we can use it. And I'm thinking that this chapter is where the story really begins. And that's actually a, um, a reference to a Goon Show episode. Goons were a radio comedy show that was done in England after the Second World War um, that my kids grew up listening to, and I listened to them too. I had heard skits from it, you know, sections of their different um, episodes and at different times and thoroughly enjoyed the humour of them. Very, very English humour, not American humour at all. Uh, lots of, of punning and various plays on words, um, but also playing with the, the with nonsense ideas. So things that were only possible to have happen in a story because it was on radio, you didn't have to prove it visibly as a thing that could be done because it was happening in your head as you were listening to the story being being played out by the different actors. Lots of fun, The Goon Show. So here's where the story really begins, kind of, in this context. The fourth chapter, A Message from Africa. That winter was a very cold one, and one night in December, when they were all sitting around the warm fire in the kitchen, just as well they had that fire, <gasps> that would have been so cold. Dear. Sorry, I'm trying to get back to the right tab on my browser. When they were all sitting around the warm fire in the kitchen and the doctor was reading aloud to them out of books he had written himself in animal language, the owl, Tutu, suddenly said, Shh, what's that noise outside? They all listened and presently they heard the sound of some someone running and then the door flew open and the monkey Chi-Chi ran in badly out of breath. Doctor, he cried, I've just had a message from a cousin of mine in Africa. There's a terrible sickness amongst the, among the monkeys out there. They are all catching it and they're all dying in hundreds. They have heard of you and they beg you to come to Africa to stop the sickness. Who brought the message? asked the doctor, taking off his spectacles. Taking off his spectacles and laying down his book. See, he obviously uses his spectacles for reading. Reading glasses. A swallow, said Chi Chi. She is outside on the rain butt. So a rain butt is a barrel that catches the rain from the roof that you use for watering the garden. There you go. A rain butt, B U T T. Bring her in by the fire. So she's standing on the edge of it. Bring her in by the fire, said the doctor. She must be perished with the cold. The swallows flew south six weeks ago. So I'm guessing she had flown south to Africa where it was warm. And she had come back because of the emergency. So the swallow was brought in, all huddled and shivering, and although she was a little afraid at first, 
She soon got warmed up and sat on the edge of the mantelpiece and began to talk. When she had finished, the doctor said, I would gladly go to Africa, especially in this bitter weather, but I'm afraid we haven't any money. I haven't money enough to buy the tickets. Get me the money box, Chi-Chi. So the monkey climbed up and got it off the top shelf of the dresser. There was nothing in it. Not one single penny. Anyone else had this, this feeling before? He's looking at the money box, holding his hand out ready, absolutely certain that there was something in there. <coughs> I feel sure there was tuppence left, said the doctor. There was, said the owl, but you spent it on a rattle for that badger's baby when he was teething. Did I, said the doctor, dear me, dear me, what a nuisance money is. Hmm. Well, never mind. Perhaps if I go down to the seaside, I shall be able to borrow a boat that will take us to Africa. I knew a seaman once who brought his baby to me with measles. Maybe he'll lend us his boat. The baby got well. So early the next morning, the doctor went down to the seashore. And when he came back, he told the animals it was all right. The sailor was going to lend them the boat. Then the crocodile and the monkey and the parrot were very glad and began to sing because they were going back to Africa, their real home. And the doctor said, I shall only be able to take you three with Jip the dog, Dab Dab the duck, Gub Gub the pig and the owl, Tutu. The rest of the animals, like the dormice and the water voles and the bats, will have to go back and live in the fields where they were born till we come home again. But as most of them sleep through the winter, they won't mind that. And besides, it wouldn't be good for them to go to Africa. So then the parrot, who had been on long sea voyages before, began telling the doctor all the things he would have to take with him on the ship. You must have plenty of pilot bread, she said, hard tack they call it, and you must have beef in cans and an anchor. <sighs> Hard tack. Let's see. Go on. Let's see. What is hard tack? I can't make you guys look everything up all the time. Um, we used to call it cabin bread when I was growing up. Hard tack are these... Hard, hard, hard crackers that was used as boat bread kind of thing. Um, let's see if I can find a better picture of it. No. It's not as good. Cabin bread. It's a particular brand of it that we used to have in New Zealand. And I'm trying to find one that's actually going to show you what it looks like in it. It doesn't look like bread at all. It's just these very hard, chunky crackers. This will have to do. Right, and find this illustration in here. Bigger. Now, cabin bread. That is the New Zealand and mm, South Pacific version of it. Uh, that's in a packet. But these here are these giant crackers that are very, they're about this thick, like, um, hunt, oh, you wouldn't know them, sorry, about this thick, about not a finger's thickness, half a finger's thickness, and really, really hard because they have cooked them to the point that there's no moisture left in them. So they're like a water cracker of sorts. Um,
it's hard to describe okay I'll see if I can find this one this is a um this one's got holes in it probably because it's been eaten by weevils or something um Oh, that's way too big. I'm looking forward to the next version of OBS because the next version of OBS will actually tell you about edges of things so you can um, know how far away the other side of your picture is that you are trying to manage and how far it's overlapping something. So you see it's a little bit, the texture of it is a little bit like um, a, a giant water cracker, the big square ones like this. We have some in New Zealand, Huntley and Palmer's water crackers, and they're fairly thick and chunky, but they're nowhere near as hard as hard tack or cabin bread that we used to call it. So you you grab one, you know how I've talked about ginger 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 nuts, the biscuits, that they're quite thick and hard, but they're they're round ones and they've got ginger spice and sugar in them. Well, they're kind of like that hard, but harder. And it's very, very simple. It's flour, it's probably got some soda of some sort in it. Um, to make sure it's it's not going to go weird um, and then they get stored in barrels or tins or something like that to keep the air out from from making them go stale uh, they could be crumbled down and put into water and cooked up so they make a kind of a kind of like a porridge all that sort of stuff nothing particularly appealing uh, a limb full of parrots and it's a picture from Shutterstock there they are, all those parrots. I just thought it would be quite suitable for what we're, we're doing today. Um, and so that's that's what the parrot, Polynesia, is saying that you need to take with you for food as one of the things that are needed. Um, pilot bread, also known as hardtack, or in New Zealand, cabin bread. And you must have beef in cans. So that would be like uh, corned beef in a tin, bully beef. Is another name for it, um, which uh, tastes absolutely disgusting if you're someone like me. And the texture is like, I have eaten it. I have had to eat it because that was what was available. Um, I'm not someone who can cope with actually doing without and going and starving. Ah, oh, tin. Yes. Sorry, I've got to show you this. Um, cabin bread tin from Allsbrooks. Allsbrooks was a brand that made um, biscuits and stuff like that. And I have found a not what I was expecting to. So this is one of the things that had been used for the New Zealand cabin bread type for storing it in, in these tins. The, the tin is about this wide, square, about this wide and about yeah my head down to my waist tall maybe slightly less than that with a round lid like this that you pry up to get into it and those sort of tins like this one here were used for so many different things and a lot of the biscuit companies would use them as their main for bulk versions of their their products they would be so, sold and stored in these sort of tins uh, and it was a great way to be able to get a container that you could use. It wasn't watertight, but it was relatively airtight in terms of it would stop food from getting too stale too quickly. Um, but I was going to tell you about corned beef, wasn't I? So tinned beef, yeah, it's a little bit like spam, but made with beef. Hmm. Uh, not particularly appealing for most of us. Let's see if I can find one of the nicknames for it is bully beef, corned beef. Uh, that's probably going to visualize it better for you than anything else. So these are all things that actually were commonly used for foods for on sh uh, traveling on ships. just because that's what they were. <laughs> Corned beef, there you go, see? 
Um, and it's a slightly tapered can and it has a little wee metal key. It's sitting on the side there and there's a tab somewhere around the bottom. You have to slide the key part onto and try not to break it. And then you turn it round, turn it round and it would wind up a strip of metal from around that bottom edge of the can. Like a spam can before the days of the pull rings on the top. And then you would pull that end off and then because of the taper on the can you could then tip it and the whole lot would slide out and it would be this preserved meat that had fat and the jelly sort of stuff with it and weird textures and I'm sorry I'm gonna to have to shut that that window on the other monitor because it's showing me some the actual what the meat looks like and I have such bad memories of the texture and the taste it like spam very very salty um, but yeah, it's got all these other aspects of it too. Um, <laughs> I can yeah. So Blue says I can eat spam with rice and eggs. It's a bit salty for me though. One of the things I did find when we were on the boat, living on the boat for a while, uh, not when I was a kid, but when I was an adult, was I would get not corned beef but spam. Is you'd slice it and then fry it, and it would get rid of the excess fat out of it. And so you had more of a meaty flavour instead of all the extra stuff that comes in the fat. Um, and then made sure you put it with other things that had plenty of flavour and it made it a lot more palatable. But yeah, you don't really want it on its own. It's very strongly flavoured. But it was a way of having meat that wasn't going to go rotten because it was actually in a can. It was preserved. Because when you tin something, when you can something, you actually apply enough heat for long enough and it's in a sealed container, the germs that are there get killed and no new ones can get in. It's, there you go. Um, so you must have plenty of bread, pilot bread, and hard which is hard tack, and beef in cans and an anchor. I expect the ship will have its own anchor, said the doctor. Well, make sure, said Polynesia, because it's very important. You can't stop if you haven't got an anchor, and you'll need a bill. What's that for? said the doctor. To tell the time by, said the parrot. You go and ring it every half an hour, half hour, and then you know what the time is, and bring a whole lot of rope. It always comes in handy on voyages. Yes, um, eight bells is four hours. And so a um, the time on a clock is divided up, the time of day on a clock is divided up. A, a ship's watch where you have the crew all working for a certain amount of time. You don't have everybody working all the time because if a, a ship is sailing, a sailing ship is sailing from one country to another, you're going over very deep oceans. You can't drop the anchor at night to, I don't know what they're going to do in the story, but you can't drop the anchor at night to stop. And so you need to have people who are going to keep on handling and looking after the boat at night while it's still going. So they are on watch then and then, they go to bed and the next lot come up on watch. And the traditional way of doing it is you'd have three watches. You'd have each watch would do four hours at a time. They would go to bed and then the next watch would start and they would do four hours. So you'd go to bed, uh, you'd, you'd finish your watch, you'd go and get yourself clean and tidy because you're often wet and salty from the sea. Um, have something to eat, have a bit of relaxing time and then you go to bed, you go to sleep for... So you have eight hours that you're not working and then you get up and you do your watch again. And you knew when it was your time for you to, do, to change over for your watch because the eight bell had rung and so it was time to change over to the next watch. Anyway, so there you go. That's what the bell's for. I know too much. Let's carry on with the story. We're nearly there. <sighs> Lots of rope. It always comes in handy on voyages. Then they began to wonder where they were going to get the money from to buy all the things they needed. Oh, bother it. Money again, cried the doctor. Goodness, I shall be glad to get to Africa where we don't have any, where we don't have to have any. I'll go and ask the grocer if he will wait for his money till I get back. No, I'll send the sailor to ask him. So the sailor went to see the grocer and presently he came back with all the things they wanted. Then the animals packed up, and after they had turned off the water so the pipes wouldn't freeze and put up the shutters, that's over the windows to protect the glass, they closed the house and gave the key to the old horse who lived in the stable, and when they had seen that there was plenty of hay in the loft to last the horse through the winter, they carried all their luggage down to the seashore and got on the boat. So 
I would say that Puddleby on the Marsh is very close to the shore, by the sound of it. The cat's meat man was there to see them off. He had brought a large suet pudding as a present for the doctor because, he said, he had been told you couldn't get suet puddings in foreign parts. No, I have not had a suet pudding. I'm not really inclined to have a suet pudding. It's not my style of food. As soon as they were on the ship, Gub Gub the pig asked where the beds were, for it was four o'clock in the afternoon and he wanted his nap. So Polynesia took him downstairs into the inside of the ship and showed him the beds, set all on top of one another like bookshelves against a wall. Bunks. Why, that isn't a bed, said Gub Gub. That's a shelf. Beds are always like that on ships, said the parrot. It isn't a shelf. Climb up into it and go to sleep. That's what you call a bunk. I don't think I'll go to bed just yet, said Gub Gub. I'm too excited. I want to go upstairs again and see them start. Well, this is your first trip, said Polynesia. You will get used to the life after a while. And she went back up the stairs of the ship, humming this song to herself. I've seen the Black Sea and the Red Sea. I rounded the Isle of Wight. I discovered the Yellow River and the Orange, too, by night. Now Greenland drops behind again and I sail the ocean blue. I'm tired of all these colours, Jane, so I'm coming back to you. They were just going to start on their voyage when the doctor said he would have to go back and ask the sailor the way to Africa. Oh dear, it's going to be one of those journeys. Oh no. But the swallow said she had been to that country many times and would show them how to get there. So the doctor told Chi Chi to pull up the anchor and the voyage began. The voyage began. There's fish jumping in the sea. There's the ship. That must be the sailor seeing them off at the jetty. And there's an anchor hanging off the stern. You usually only do that if you've already got one hanging off the bow. You don't just randomly have an anchor off the stern of the boat. And when you're at a wharf or a jetty or a dock, you don't usually have the anchors in use. You just use a rope. Oh, well, we will let them get away with this. We will, we will just ignore the fact that we know a little bit more about boats than apparently the author does. We won't let the facts get in the way of a good story. We have one of those the same ships here in display at our museum. Oh, that would be wonderful. That's, that's what Q's saying. Um, there's a maritime museum in the city central right in the central part of our city um which is about an hour's drive away maybe an hour and a half's drive away from where i live and it's the maritime museum has a whole lot of things on display but they've also got a ship that's an old sailing ship but it's a small old sailing ship uh, just used for small coastal work and they have some of the people who work there are trained in how to sail it because it's a little bit different to sailing a modern ship where you have winches and um, pulleys and no, they'd have pulleys, but it's got it doesn't have the same sort of machinery on it that a modern sailing vessel uses, um, and it's a lot more muscle required. But there's also techniques, and it's quite good because the school children will go to the museum, they'll have a visit through the different displays that are on there, and then sometimes it will be arranged that they will be going out on this, this small sailing ship um, out into the harbour, and they'll be pulling the ropes and having turns at steering it and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, bunks are very tiny, and they often... Oh, okay, they don't often show it to preserve. Yes, uh, but when it's actually a genuinely old thing, um, they try to make sure it's looked after very carefully so that that little piece of history that we can actually still learn from, we may think we've learned everything we can from it, but people in the future may have other things that they can learn from it that we haven't thought of. And so if we look after it carefully, it will still be available for them to be able to, to, to learn things from it as well. Um, I do know that there are some aspects of the way things used to be done on traditionally that we think of as being really really hard work because it's very based on using muscles to do stuff where if you are doing it all the time it's no big deal it's just the normal way to do it and you don't have a comparison 
you don't go oh well it's so much faster if I go in a car instead of riding a horse or walking if you've never had a car and cars don't exist that's just the normal way that everyone does things and so our attitude to a lot of things are it's so much easier now well it is easier for us because we have the comparison and that, that luxury but people in in other times didn't have those things and so they can't they don't have that comparison to be made anyway enough of the sermonizing that's the end of today's reading we will be starting next time with the fifth chapter which is the great journey and the story will get underway properly then instead of just beginning so there you go have you actually heard the story of the story of dr doolittle oh i just realized that that doesn't actually all fit on that on that line in my overlay i will have to go and make adjustments <coughs> i was wondering why it looked odd the story of doctor by hugh lofting mm, yeah <laughs> So bunks, some bunks are usually more fixed in place, or they have a a bar with um, canvas or something that people sleep in. Otherwise, that even earlier people used to use hammocks, and they have to pack them away so that they're not in the way when they when they have when they're not sleeping, uh, and then they get them out and hang them up um, in the right place for um, sleeping in. Uh, rather than it just being something that you have on the porch on a, in summer in the holidays. They actually were a functioning, working thing. Uh, just because that's how it was done. Uh, and warships, old sailing warships, you needed as much room as possible so everyone's bedding was packed away um, when you weren't actually using it. It didn't make sense to have the, the space unavailable. So there you go. All sorts of stuff. All sorts of random, random, random stuff. Um, I'm going to check to see if we've got somebody that we can go and raid. I don't know that any of my other, um, my other um, readers are reading at the moment. I'll just see if there's anyone online at the moment. No, that one's 18 plus. Picture of Dorian Gray isn't really granny friendly. But we can go and find the other one that we went to, the owl one, the hoot, something, hoot, hoot, hoot. I've got the link here. I've gone too big, too far, haven't I? Yes, I've gone too far again. Yeah. Hoot house. Think it was Hoot House live stream. There it is. Okay, so I'm going to get this set up. So it'll be the same as what we had the previous time. Yes, you're most welcome. I'm so glad that you could be here to be part of it, Q, and I'm glad that you are getting better, even if it's taking a while. That's okay. That happens. Um, but great that you can be here and enjoying it so it looks like hoot house is actually online at the moment there are not a lot of people there at the moment so when you arrive say hi to them that there's not a lot of chat that happens on oh great thank you so q has said that she's put a link into the for the exhibit in the discord server so i will give you the link my link for the discord server again so if you haven't joined it, you can use that link and join it. Uh, it's another one of the free services. Yeah, there's a there's a section of it you can pay for to use, but none of us do. Uh, well, most of us don't. Um, but you can use all of my server without it being a paid thing. Um, so if you want to follow that link that Q has just shared, you'll need to join my Discord server. But that's a good idea. And it's very quiet. You're not going to get overtaxed with it. But... Let's go off and see Hoot House and see if there are any owls or any other things flying around or if the horses are back in the horse shed because they've got a new camera there which actually shows one of the, the spaces that the owls sometimes go and perch in. And it's a good time of day for us because it's evening over there. It's dark. It's, in, it's that far through the evening. It's nearly 10 o'clock at night. 
yes I think so here we go we'll see you over there and if if you're not coming that's okay you're welcome back here again sometime and I really enjoy reading for you have a great week or a few however many days until next time I see you because I do read three days a week Monday Wednesday Wednesday Friday 3 p.m New Zealand time which is on my schedule in your language your time zone what it is for you um, and in the meantime happy reading but let's go and raid them we'll see them in a few minutes come on why are you taking so long ready to raid yes let's do it raid now Yep. 